the organisers for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to tell you about some work that is, um, I guess, ongoing. So most of this stuff is not published, but we're getting close, so we're kind of getting excited. I'll try and uh, run you through some things. Um, so I think the main problem that we've struggled with in, in early evolution is that we used to be focusing on how can we take things like genomes and reconstruct uh, ancestral states. And the big problem that we've run up against is that now that we're awash with data, uh, the signal actually seems to be quite poor. So, oh, sorry, yeah. So here's just one example from work that uh, we've done, which sort of is, is I threw this in because there's a lot of RNA stuff in the uh, meeting, but people have done the same thing for uh, proteins as well. Basically what we did was we looked at the RFAM database, which is a, a big database with 15, nearly 1,500 RNA families, and asked, well, how many things appear in more than one domain? And as you can see from this Venn diagram, the numbers are very small. And when you look at what's actually there and likely to be conserved, you know, it's, it's basically stuff associated with the ribosome. So we've obviously heard quite a bit about the ribosome uh, in previous sessions, and then RNAs P, uh, the tRNAs. So this is sort of stuff you would, you would be able to, uh, I think, guess from um, w without too much trouble. There's a few other little details in there, but the main point is that there's very little signal there. Uh, the signal is consistent with what people uh, get when they look at protein uh, data in genomes. Uh, but, you know, that's, we could sort of say, well, maybe we can think of better ways to do that, or maybe we can uh, rethink how we're doing stuff. So if the signal's limited, uh, what else can we do? Um, one of the things that people do, and this is a, little, a nice little paper of uh, Aaron's, is to look at modern stuff and say, well, there's some interesting analogies between modern biological systems and presumed ancient systems. Um, what we're trying to do is sort of say, okay, that's a, a great idea. Can we take that a little bit further and say, um, do some experiments to try and retrace some of the steps towards evolution of modern systems, but more from a biological perspective, sort of coming top down, if you will. So uh, there's been a lot of really impressive high-tech uh, presentations around uh, methods. Um, I've seen some you know, quite, quite spectacular pieces of work, and I just wanted to contribute our own high-tech approach uh, to how we do this experiment. So uh, this is a uh, school lunchbox, which we use to pack in more and more uh, multiple uh, evolution experiments on top of one another. So uh, there you go. There's all kinds of ways you can do astrobiology. So, uh, some of the questions we're trying to grapple with with our little lunchbox set up uh, are listed here, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I will give you a brief overview. So this one here um, is to do with understanding how bacterial translation initiation evolved, and I'll talk about that one a little more. This one I don't have time to talk about, but um, I'm happy to talk to people about this. So we've done a little experiment where we've applied uh, a continual bottleneck to, to see whether we get com complex RNA processes. And, I'm um, happy to chat with that, uh, about that later on. And then the final one is we're ac actually looking now at uh, trying to understand how DNA might have evolved, uh, and I'll come back to that again at the end. So for translation initiation, one of the things that we, we thought was puzzling as biologists is that uh, bacteria use this uh, formulation process. So everybody charges their tRNAs, so you get a, a charged... Um, tRNA, so this is the initiator, uh, and then in bacteria you have a couple of extra steps that you don't find in our or eukaryotes. The first one is addition of uh, uh, the formal group here through an enzyme called a formal transferase. Translation then proceeds, uh, but as the uh, growing peptide comes out of the, uh, the ribosome exit site, another enzyme, peptide deformylase, comes along and whops that uh, formate group off again. Uh, so this is before the proteins really had a chance to do anything. So it's an odd thing that you add something and then remove it uh, all prior to getting to a point of a, a functioning protein. Um, interestingly, if you treat with a drug that knocks out uh, production of uh, this cofactor that's required for this reaction here, uh, you force cells to use the unmodified version here, so a methionyl tRNA. Um, you can also do knockouts, which cells don't really like, but they are viable, where you eliminate both of these genes and uh, you get the same thing, uh, proceeding, translation proceeding with an unmodified uh, version of, the methionine, of methionine. Uh And finally, uh, if we look across the tree of life, this is a, 
Uh, it's not a universal process. You only see this in bacteria. Our carrier and eukaryotes don't do this. So um, we thought, gee, that looks a bit strange. It sort of looks uh, partly like it's not that important or necessary because only some parts of the tree use it. Uh, and it's intriguing that you can knock something out that's being conserved within bacteria for possibly several billion years. So we did uh, an experiment to figure that out. So what, what uh, Alana Rickaby, who's here, and Ryan Catchpole um, did was to do so a bunch of experiments, and this is one of them here. So what we're doing is we're evolving uh, two lines over about 1,500 generations. So this blue line here is just a wild-type control, and this gray one here is a knockout where we've eliminated both of those genes required for formulation. And you can see that after about 1,500 generations, their, their growth is indistinguishable. Um, so it seems that you can be a, a bacterium quite happily without this process. Um, the thing that we thought was quite unusual about this is that the addition and removal looks a little bit like a toxin-antitoxin system. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with these ideas. They're sort of addiction systems. So given we don't have a lot of time, I'll walk you through the experiment that we did to test this at the same time as explaining what they are. Um, so we think it's, it, this, may have, it, this could have evolved originally via a selfish element. Uh, so let's do this experiment here. Let's reintroduce those uh, de uh, deformulase and formal, uh, formulase genes back into these evolved lines. And so the way we did that is to put them onto a plasmid. If you put a plasmid into a cell uh, without any, any kind of selection, marker or whatever, uh, it will sometimes missegregate and you can have individuals that lose the plasmid, but they're not affected by that. In our experiment, what we've done is we force the uh, plasmid out by using a temperature sensitive one. So we kick it out, and what you see here is two different lines. So these two, one of these is colony forming units, and the other is optical density. So two ways of measuring growth. And you can see this is the uh, plasmid occupancy. You can see the plasmid gets kicked out pretty quickly, uh, but it has no effect on growth. If we take a known toxin antitoxin system and do the same experiment, so we take the sa exact same plasmid put a toxin-antitoxin system on it and then uh, force a kick out, we get a very different curve here. So there are two things that are, that are happening here. Um, one is the plasmid is getting kicked out, but the second is that both the measurements of growth are uh, showing a reduction in growth. And so what's happening in this system here is that when you get a knockout of the a loss of the, uh, the plasmid, you get cell death. And this is sort of the cleverness of these addiction systems. Now basically, the way they work is if you get, get rid of one gene um, that is your, effectively your antidote to the toxin, and both of these are uh, carried here, then you can no longer protect yourself against the toxin and you die. So um, we did the same, exact same experiment, reintroducing our two um, genes, the formulase and the, and the methyltransferase, uh, back on a plasmid. And if we get this kind of result, then we would say there's no sort of selfish element activity. If we get this kind of result, it would be consistent with this um, post-segregation or killing uh, phenotype. And here is the uh, result. So we think that's pretty clear that once you've removed uh, these two genes from this lineage, uh, and evolved uh, them to sort of tolerate not having them, and you put them back in, you don't get sort of a, a complementation phenotype, you get uh, a, a, an addiction phenotype. So what we think is, is happening then is that these things are functional now, and it's sort of, you could argue everything's co-evolved, you kind of need them because they're there, uh, but it's not obvious to us that this is particularly adaptive, and there's two reasons for that. One is we can get rid of it with no effect on uh, growth after we've sort of readapted the lineages. The other two lineages, RKR and eukaryotes, don't use this. Um, so it seems that this, there may not be an adaptive function. What we think might instead have happened is that uh, this uh, parasite got in uh, and uh, ensconced itself in translation, and then the whole system is sort of co-evolved around that. And once it's, it's done that, you can't actually get rid of it, but not for reasons of it being advantageous. Okay. So the second thing, just how am I going for time, Aaron? A uh, little bit of time? Couple minutes. Okay, cool. So I just uh, used the last... Uh, couple of slides just to tell you some stuff that's much earlier on in the process. Uh, we're interested in this uh, pathway here. This shows how uh, the D DNA building blocks are made in all cells. So basically what happens is you get the RNA building blocks here, an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase performs a uh, reaction to convert these into deoxy um, 
ribonucleotides. But as you can see, if you start from U, your fourth um, deoxy is going to be a deoxy U. And there's a bolt-on pathway here uh, to get to T. So um, some of you may hopefully have seen a um, poster by uh, Alana Rickaby, but if you haven't, please come take a look at it. Uh, she's uh, been addressing this, uh, these two questions here. One, can we delete these steps? The answer is yes, you can. So she now has lines growing that uh, don't do any of these uh, steps here. So they should stop at deoxy U. Uh, and then what we've been doing is trying to get them to adapt to the absence of um, uh, this pathway by uh, supplementing them with uh, deoxy T in the uh, medium, but then t uh, ratcheting down the amount that they have. And so uh, it's still early days, but she now has them growing without supplement whatsoever. So uh, next question will be sort of what's happening there at the genome level uh, is uracil accumulating. Uh, we've also gone after uh, ribonucleotide reduction, and I'll just show you some very preliminary results on that. So the question we, we sort of had is, can we eliminate this pathway? Uh, it turns out we can do a, a knockout of that, uh, and you have to supplement with the four deoxyribonucleosides for this um, cell line to survive. Um, so two people have been working on this, Nelly Sibayeva, a former honors student, and Sam Aris, who's uh, uh, in the lab as the technician at the moment, but is probably more a postdoc than a technician. And what you can see is over about eight transfers that we've done so far, uh, we see a tenfold reduction in the dependency. So this is sort of minimum concentration that these um, E. coli can survive on uh, in terms of supplements. So they're in a minimal media with a little bit of glucose uh, and then a um, supplement of deoxyribonucleoside. So they're clearly adapting to that. This may be tricky to see, but while here's some wild type E. coli. And what we get is a very interesting sort of elongate stress uh, morphology in these bacteria. So this is at transfer one. You can see that these E. coli are much, much longer than in the wild type. And some of these are you know, ridiculously long um, by about transfer six. So the sort of, um, some of them may be, I think, 30 to 40 <laughs> micrometers. So they're huge, um, not very heavy. But anyway, so we're, we're still working on that. And of course, one of the challenges is whether we, we actually need to eliminate this before we um, we can get complete uh, loss of um, dependency on this pathway here. So I'll, I'll leave you with that teaser and uh, just uh, make some acknowledgements to the people who do the work. And obviously, if you ever want to do any research involving lunchboxes, uh, I can highly recommend this New Zealand company here that makes probably the world's best school lunchboxes for scientific use. Thank you. <laughs>I mean, we've done a bunch of other uh, experiments which I didn't have time to present, but you know, we've knocked them into the genome uh, and looked at whether there's a fitness improvement. There isn't. Um, we we noticed that they become very, very difficult to knock out as soon as you've got them in. Um, we uh, yes, we, we we've also sort of evolved the uh, the knock in lines again uh, to see whether the system readapts and it becomes very difficult to remove them, and and we definitely see that. So there's there's a bunch of other data for sure. Okay, uh, thank you. And so we have to move to our next speaker. Thank, thanks again. And